In this episode, I'm here with Mike Littrell, the CEO and founder of X3 Sports. Mike is a returning guest and a fan favorite to the GSD show. And last time he was here, we spoke about how he built his five locations to over $5 million. He flew out to Phoenix last time, and this time I'm flying out to Atlanta, Georgia to meet with him in one of his five locations where we actually sit in the ring in one of his studios. Mike has really understood how to build a great team that focuses on the details of sales and marketing while keeping high profits and a really, really great culture. He's also spoken at GSDCon a few times and every time he goes up, he is an attendee favorite. So sit back, relax, and enjoy one of my favorite episodes of the GSD show. Mike, back again. Yes, yes. Glad to have you guys. I love interviewing a Mike because I just <laughs> it's just easy for me to remember. I'll never forget your name. But no, man, we, we are in your house now in the ring. And we actually have some ringside guests, some, some other loud members that drove up for this, which is pretty cool. Okay. Um, but this is really cool because I've, I've been watching your videos. I, I feel like I've been in here already because I've watched so much of your stuff on social. You've built now, this, this is five locations that you've got, right? Right. And we're in Atlanta. Um, are they all in Atlanta? Four of them are in the Atlanta or Metro Atlanta area. Okay. Technically, two are in Atlanta, two are right outside Marietta area. And then okay. one is our fourth one is in our fifth one, excuse me, is in Athens, which okay. is where the University of Georgia is. So it's about about 90 miles from here. It, did you start with one or mm -hmm. did you buy a couple? No, nope. started with one, kind of built it from the ground up and uh, really just you know, kind of hustled everything, you know, worked hard, you know, literally made a little money, then was able to buy a little more equipment. And yeah. um, I've got tons of stories about that on how, uh, uh, in fact, one of the stories was how we had this new ring that was coming, but it, it hadn't been in yet. And so I was trying to sell people on the vision. Right. And uh, I had this little area kind of sectioned off and I'm like, yeah, the ring's going to be right here. And you're going to be able to train right here and work in the ring and this and that. And, you know, what was cool was, you know, by the end of it, people didn't even realize there wasn't a ring there. And I kept saying, oh, the ring is coming. It's on back order. We're waiting for it. Well, it was on back order because I couldn't afford to buy a ring. <laughs> and I needed to get enough clients to be able to do it. And about eight months into it, I could, I finally afforded that right, ring. Right. So um, it was kind of like the idea was, look, at the end of the day, when they came in and trained, it was nobody even realized there wasn't a ring because the ring wasn't what they needed. It was right, right. The, the experience. And so, of course. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, yeah, we're in the ring and uh, it's, it's kind of sentimental on one level, but it's also functional on another. I love it. I love it. Well, what I want to learn from you is the lessons that a lot of people that are looking to get their second, third, fourth, or fifth location going, the lessons of if I had to do it again, yeah. or if I had to build five now, but let's say I had generally around the same budgeting, what would I do differently? What are some things that I would think through? So I want you to imagine it's me. Yeah. I, I want you to coach me through this. I've got one location that's doing okay right now. Right. So it's, it's making some money. Let's say I'm taking home about 4,000, 5,000 a month profit, right? And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if I have six of these, I take home 30,000 a right. month profit. Um, what are some things that you're coaching me through to make sure I'm A, making the right decision to get another location in the first place? Um, and then how to start thinking through the process. So yeah. just coach me. Yeah, for sure. Well, the first thing we would start with is, you know, kind of what is your current structure? Like, what do you do in the business? Yeah. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of times, you know, my first mistake was I, made sure that, of course, you got to pay your team, you got to pay your staff, you got to buy all your equipment, you got you to cover all the bills, and you're the last person to get paid, which means you're usually the cheapest labor you can afford. Of course. <laughs> so what ends up happening is, you know, if, if you're not starting capitalized, you're, you're kind of just, you know, working your way up piece by piece. So the first thing is, it's great if you're making a profit, does that mean in, on top of paying yourself? a salary or, or whatever for the work you do. Right. Because when you go to your next one, who's going to do that work? Mm -hmm. Is it still going to be you or are you going to be replacing yourself? And thus, you're going to have to pay that person, which means are you still going to pay yourself or does right. that money have to go to the person who's going to take your job? Are your leads slipping through the cracks? Does managing your software keep you up at night? Does customer support take days, weeks, or even months to get back to you? We get it. Fit Pro Tracker was developed by gym owners for gym owners. 
With FitPro Tracker, you can easily process payments, create and sell products, schedule your sessions, market your business, and communicate with your contacts, all in one fitness software. See why hundreds of gym owners are making the switch to FitPro Tracker today. Got it. Okay, so important to know that the business needs to be turning a good profit without me having to run it. Right. Because it's going to have to be that way when I get the second one going. Right. Okay, so let's move into that box. Yeah. Let's say I have that. Okay. Let's say I'm, my business is generating a $5,000 a month profit, mm -hmm. and I've got a manager in there. Okay. Um, is it the right time for me to get another location, or should I still focus on my first one? Yeah, so th those, those are kind of like those questions uh, which are, it depends on that individual. You know, right. it kind of goes back to what are you looking to accomplish? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes growth, and, and one thing I learned was more didn't always mean more in profit. Right. It might mean more in responsibility, more in things to do. Um, and sometimes I've seen growth where you actually increase in, you know, expenses and, and responsibilities, but you actually decrease profits. Right. So, you know, the question is, is, uh, you know, how much does the second location require beyond building that, that infrastructure? So like, do you need to add sort of a district manager, which is a little bit outside of the scope of your club structure? You know, you start building a, a mini corporate structure. Sometimes you're that person. Right. So I would say, you know, like a lot of things, you don't, you know, necessarily need to jump into that, but you need to understand at what point will you need to add certain things when you're not going to be doing it anymore. Yeah. Um, and it's important because it shows, you know, from a, from a strategy standpoint and a structure standpoint, it gives clarity for you. Like, what am I actually doing in the business? Cause a yeah. lot of times what I did is when I got my first location then my second location, then my third location. And really I was acting as kind of the district manager. So I was running to every club, probably almost every day, you know, spending a couple hours every day at every club meeting with the team there. And that's fine for a while. Like that might be fine. That might be my role. I didn't have it as clearly defined as that. I would just right. show up and be like, okay, what do I need to do today? Right, right. Um, so I wasn't as detailed with what my managers, you know, how to do it and, and, and get proficient at it. But you know, as a whole, we knew what the club structure needed and I was acting as that district manager. Yeah. One of the things that when you, when you're trying to grow and scale, something I, I took from somebody in the tech industry was we're going to grow until we break the company and we're going to change processes and systems once we've broken the company. What do you mean by that? So that means a lot of times, oh, we're going to be a hundred head count and we're going to be this and we're going to need all these systems and processes. So when you have one studio, you don't need all those things. Right. It's, it's, it's exhausting and you don't need layers of management. But there comes a point where you're trying to do everything and you realize, oh, I haven't put somebody in position. So, the, so how I was doing it with one location to two locations to three, I was hitting my thresholds. And then I started noticing when we added our fourth, everything changed. Why? I couldn't be in four places. I couldn't connect to all the people. I then needed to rely on leaders and managers to see the problems and, and fix them rather than wait for me to show up to help them see it and then fix them. Mm. And that was a limitation on me, not the people, you right, know, because right. I wasn't good enough at leading a four and then a five unit organization. You know, what it takes to run a million dollar company is different than what it takes to run a five million, which probably 10 million, but one, one million to five million or zero to five million is probably one level of company. Yeah. Once you get from, once you get to that 10 or trying to get to that $10 million mark, you got to have a different structure from one to 10 million to operate that zero to one for me is harder than one to 10 and many people that's the case <laughs> yeah 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 so so now that you know that you're coaching me on this here how do i start prepping for that like let's say okay I, i've got the one and let's say i go okay well based on that maybe i need to make a little bit more money right because five thousand dollar profit at a location well that's good but I could still make another 15K profit in it. Right. And, and if I could find a way to make that extra 15K, I got 20K left. Now, would that afford me not only people, but good people that could be able to operate without as much accountability? Because they, they hold themselves to a certain yeah. standard, right? I think that's super important too, because when you have a manager at one location that you're the owner of, that manager, you can really train up pretty well. Right. But when you're getting your fourth, fifth location, you really need less training wheel time. 
Yeah, and that's that's a great point. I think in an, another variable to where why did we break between three and four was most of those other those first three locations. I either went in and started it as the GM or training with the, the managers. So I felt like I got a lot of hands on uh, coaching with them to get them into a position where when I left, it's about probably eighty percent of how I would do it. You know, and so there was that leeway. When we went to four, I no longer trained the person. Somebody else did. So now, you know, we've all seen, you know, the the discussion or you know about, you know, when you take something and you make a copy and then you make another copy yeah. and then you make another copy, your fifth or sixth copy of the copy very starts diluted. to be a little bit more blurry. Yeah. Uh, and so that's where stronger processes and systems come into play. You know, we had good processes and systems, but as you get bigger, they got to be even more tight and more specific and, and not like, Oh, you know, just, you know, if this happens, kind of do this or kind of do that. It has to be, no, you have to do this or you have to do that. Or I have to be okay with letting you make a judgment call within this parameter. Right. Be flexible within the framework. Sales. That's something you've done really, really well. As you're opening up that second studio, that's something that you're going to want to get really quickly. Because if not, what happens? Your first studio has got to fund. Yeah the shortcomings of the second studio. Yeah, you're working so, hard and making less. <laughs> so how, what are some things you would do with that second studio in order to make 100% sure that you can open up in the black and give yourself every opportunity to not have to take away from the winning studio right. to pay for the losing studio? Yeah. Well, as we know, pre-sale is kind of one whole element and animal. And if it depends on, you know, again, logistically where you're at in relation to your existing studio, is there recognition, brand, and name? Um, but what I would ultimately say is the mistake a lot of times is thinking that the team you have, and even though yourself, I can just do that for both. Right. And what ends up happening is now you're splitting your time and you're focusing half the time on something that you've dedicated full-time effort to in the past. Mm -hmm. Or, sometimes worse, you're putting a lot more on the new, new baby and forgetting and about the old And I've seen that one. a lot. And yeah, and you start to see that go down. Um, so I think the biggest thing is, you know, you don't have to replicate the exact staff and the exact structure. Structure. You might have five trainers here and you may say, I'm only starting with two because I don't have enough class and volume yet. But quickly, I want to know that I can go to three, four, and five. But what I would ultimately be able to do is say, you know, it's a timing thing as much as it's what to do and when to do it. Mm -hmm. So don't be afraid to hire the people you need before you're ready to open. If you're already, let's say, in build-out phase or you've already got a lease signed, and, you know, if you can estimate, like, let's say you're 180 days out, so six months, when do you need to hire your staff? When do they need to start training? Do you want them to hit the ground running or do you want to be opening up and then starting training? Right, right. Um, some of it's a budget decision. I can't afford to pay people double to, to sit here. Yeah. So I think there's creative ways that you do that. And, and to me, I, I budgeted under training and coaching uh, or marketing. Okay. So, for instance, I might hire my, my salesperson or my managers, one or two trainers, and I, and I convert them into being, one, coming into the current clubs that we have and shadowing and working the same process in a successful club. So if we're 90 days out, maybe that's when that starts. On top of that, as we get closer to getting ready to open, now I might say, but here's the next conversion. We're going to go into being the street team. We're going to go and blanket the area so everyone knows who we are and that we're coming in 60 days or right. 90 days. And I want them to meet me and I want them to know you. And I want them to say, hey, by the way, just be prepared. I'm going to stop back in with more collateral for you. I'm going to give you more right. passes. I just want to let you know, is there anything that you know we can connect with? You know, Just really embed in the community. Right. Um, so you know, it, and what that does is, is it ramps up your team. It shows them the things they should be doing anyway, but as long as they've got a leader who's willing to go do it with them and show them what to do, how to do it, and why it's important, we're going to reap the benefits together. Right, right. Um, one of the things that I've seen with you is you're a really, really good leader, um, and you really know how to rally the people behind you. You're talking GSD Con about core values and how your team uses them. It was fantastic. How do you get your team for the new studio really behind going crazy with sales? Because they're going to have to. Yeah. What are you saying to them? What are you What are you helping create a vision for so that you can really get their best? Because that's what the business needs, especially right. in the pre-sale process. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got to remember each team's a little bit different and each team has different chemistry uh, when you start going that way. But that's where core values come into play. Like we can 
have a different chemistry, but we all have a similar or a, a, a common core value. A of, North of, Star of that's how right. we behave. That's right. And so as that team starts to gel and starts to come together, you know, I think a lot of times we assume that because we've done it once, we can just turn around and rinse and repeat. And we forget all the little nuances that we had to do to put that team together and help them get over those bumps and hurdles. Like you, you, you can be excited about learning something new, learn a language, learn a new sport, right? get a great coach. You know, part of it is going to practice, doing the reps and knowing that if you get stuck somewhere, you're not by yourself. You're with a, with a championship coach or a winning team right. that's going to help you get out, get over those humps and hurdles. And if along the way, you also are able to see who does want to really grow and become more or who's like, oh, I just got the job, but this isn't really what I signed up for. Yeah. No problem. Appreciate you giving it a shot. You know, I'm happy to be a reference. I'm happy to, you know, maybe in the future, see what else comes this way. But this is what this team needs to be successful and a winner. And sometimes people shy away from those conversations because they don't want to be mean or rude. And it's like, no, I'm just, we're going somewhere and it's exciting. Right. And it's going to be hard and we right. need to do it together. What do you look for in that salesperson, the killer? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, there's, there's so many ways to do it. Uh, you know, I've had to get really understanding that not everyone has to be me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit like, go, 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 and I don't need a whole lot of direction. Tell me, tell me where we're going and get out of my way. Let me do it. Right, right. Um, but sales, as we know, can be nuanced. It isn't just going out and grabbing people and bringing them in. That's, that's one phase. Right. But then there's nurturing. Not everybody's ready today. Not everybody. So who's good at building relationships? Who's easy to talk to? Who's who do you want to talk to? Like if, if you don't even want to, if somebody's already awkward and doesn't, you know, make you feel comfortable talking to them, it's gonna it's gonna be hard trying to influence them to to make a decision right. that they're already maybe scared to make. Right. Um, not that those things can't be learned. So you try to teach people like, why do you like this? Because I, I, I found success in hiring people from other industries, mm -hmm. but I've also found the most success is when somebody has the skill sets that apply to other industries, but they have the desire and passion because they personally do it themselves, whether right. it's what we offer in here or they're a committed fitness person on their own right. Right. Because then they speak from experience. As far as metrics go, if I'm a sales guy working for you, how do I know if I'm winning and losing? Yeah. Like what, what, what are the metrics I need to pay attention to and what, what are the metrics of a really good top performer? Yeah. So it starts with obviously getting in front of as many people, which we would say leads. How many right. leads, how many contacts? And it can be as, you And they know, would create their own too, not just getting them from paid traffic. Bingo. They have to create them. Because, you know, paid traffic is great. And, you know, when I started, we didn't have that such thing. <laughs> right, right. So I had to learn like, oh, it was get out, take flyers, and chase people down in the streets. And they were like, wait, this, why is this guy following me? Right. <laughs> um, but you had to quickly disarm. And more importantly... Talk about what you're doing from an excitement type mind. Like, this is what we're doing. It's awesome. And oh, by the way, here's how it's for you. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you looking for? Right. Oh, you want to get in shape. You want to change it. What do you do now? What do you currently train? And in that time early on when we first started, I mean, the only options were really like, we knew it was going to be like the big box gym. Right, right. Or nothing. That was the style. That was it. Like, boutiques really didn't That's exist. That's what I thought, too. Everything was big box, whether it was LA Fitness, 24-hour. That's right. Goals. That was the big stuff. This yeah. stuff really started blowing up around 2010. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. You see that transition. So you know now you know, I, I'm noticing that there's tons of boutique offerings, and so I think the consumers are getting more educated. So they have the ability to you know to charge 150, 200 bucks a month is no longer out of the question. It's not absurd. It's actually like yeah, I ex but I expect a higher quality of service and higher quality right. of product. Right. Um, I expect it to help solve a lot of the problems that the box gyms don't, which is great. I got all this stuff. What am I supposed to do with it? How do I do it? So your, your people here, for example, how many leads are you hoping they generate on their own on a monthly basis, weekly basis, however you measure? Yeah. So the, the main thing is, is we try to get each individual to be conscious of generating a hundred leads a month personally okay. per, on their own, on their own. And now on their own can be a lot of, there's a hundred ways to do that. I've never been a guy who's great at, Hey, here's one way to go generate a hundred leads. Right. It's how do you learn, you know, a hundred ways to generate one and then get better each one of those. And you start getting, because they don't all work the same way, the same right, time. Right. Sometimes this is going great for you. And then all of a sudden it dries up. Right. So, you know, and so, but so referrals, cause as we've talked about in, in times past, every member you sign up is going to refer probably two people. 
Now the question is, are they going to refer them through you, or are they just going to bring them in and then they're going to land in sort of the right. generic category? Right. So are you getting buddy referrals? Like from the day one, who else can we help? Who else can we share this journey with? Um, right. We have a, a, the VIP process, which is at the point of sign up. We expect that our team will present that you have 10 VIP passes, which gives anyone they want a free week. And we want them to be, we don't just want them to fill out names and numbers just to get the sheet done. You know, we want them to be like, look, I would rather you think of at least the first three to five people that you know need this. And, right. and if you're not comfortable just handing this stuff over, Let's still get them down. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have you send an email, CC me on it, and just introduce us before I reach out to you. You know, it's funny. That's one of the things I've seen a lot of people make big mistakes on with the referral sheet. The, the difference between one person and another person that, let's say, this, you have this one salesperson, and they go, yeah, I got all these referrals, but like I can't get a hold of most of them. Mm -hmm. I get a hold of like 10 of them out of 100. Yeah. You got another person who's like, I sign up like 30 out of 100. That's right. And the difference, what I've noticed is one of them checks it off their list. I got five names and numbers. Yeah. You're going to have to work that list. So if you just checked it off the list, you got a name and a number, yep. all you really did was give yourself extra work that's not going to give you the result that you want. Whereas another person's like really selling the reason why this person's on this list yeah. and the importance of it. When you really get that down, now it's like whole cool. game changes. Like, yeah, the, the person I'm following up with now, yeah. the, as a salesperson, I don't want to call the lead that is an item on the list. You right. just gave me worthless work well, to that's do. That's right. <laughs> I have to follow. I want to know who is this person. Right. Oh, how do you know him? Oh, that's great. Give me a note. So when I call him, it's just easier for me to get him in that's the door. That's right. I think a lot of people struggle with that because yeah. they're doing. A, I've seen people doing a good job getting referrals point of sale, but weak checklist style. Yeah, yeah and, and that's something we also talk about is, is getting comfortable learning what to do and then getting good at how to do it. Right. You know, because again, I don't need a hundred leads from you. I need those leads to convert into fifteen or twenty leads new members don't pay for the you. Bills. Right. Right. So here's that's what we, you know, that at least it gives us something to go, okay, let's let's work on that area now. Right. So everything you just talked about is is getting into it like, okay, great, you got your hundred leads. Did that boost your appointments? Did that boost your shows? And are we ultimately getting new people in the door? Yeah. And another piece of that is just you know, the why behind it, not just why, because, oh, it's part of my job to get referrals or get leads. You know, if I truly care about helping people, people usually aren't in here because it's just for themselves. Right. There's, there's, there's more to it. There's the family, there's the friends, there's, there's something. And so a lot of times people love to share that journey or they love to, you know, they know that there's other people, especially if you've delivered for them, you know, they're getting an amazing experience. And, and look, we, day one, I get it. We haven't proven anything to you other than we can give you a great class and we can get you committed to starting. Right, right. So don't be afraid to follow up. Like we don't treat those new members like if I don't get them day one, okay, I didn't get any leads. Great. Where's your seven day checkup? Where's your 30 day checkup? That's when you can get them. Like if I'm doing a good job for you, who else can I help? Right, right, right. So it's more of, again, not just keep doing it, but do it the right way at the right time. Yeah. You were at our GSD con last month, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Michael Burnoff, you got to see him speak. Yeah, yeah he's awesome. R one thing that stuck with me, I thought was great. I don't know if you took away this or if you got if you caught it, but he goes, "Who would be the biggest beneficiary of you getting this outcome?" Yeah. And you know, as a hypothetical, I think it was like my daughter. Great, do it for her. Right. Yeah, like that, that, was, that was yeah. So great because it, I think people will do less for themselves than they will for their kids right. or whoever, somebody else. Right. P people will spend more money on their kids' sports activities yep. and dance and whatever they've got going on than they will on their gym membership. Yeah. Because the kids are always first. That's right. But when you realize that taking care of yourself is that way, it's great. Personal story, it's amazing. My, my sister ended up, um, you know, she was gaining a little bit more weight. Her daughter was like 11 at the time. And I guess her daughter was like a, a little concerned about it. And my sister Amanda, she just started working really, really hard. It was all through mm -hmm. COVID too. Yeah. <clears throat> started doing all this stuff virtually, which she was one of the people that like, she does great virtually. <clears throat> well, she lost like 30 pounds or something. Right. She got really, really fit looking like super fit where everyone in the family was like, dang, what are you doing? Yeah. Right. And she ended up winning member of the year at the gym and her daughter, 11 years old was crying, congratulating her. So happy for her. Yeah. How, 
much of a superhero do you think my sister felt that day? Yeah. And what lessons are you sending and teaching? Because, I mean, I think when you look at most of us in the fitness industry, we're in it from a much deeper level than just wanting to be in the business. Yeah. Um, we could probably be doing other things. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, I, I get to talk to my team about why I love doing this, you know, and the skills that I have to learn are just to enhance the right. ability to help more people. Because I know what, you know, those kind of things, whether it's sports, athletics, being fit, you know, we just went through, you know, the pandemic components. And it's like, how much did people shy away from working out and how many leaned into it right. to deal with what goes on? And I, I catch myself coming in every day to work out, not because I think I'm going to get, you know, in better shape other than I need, right. I need to be in better mental shape than right. the physicals right there. And it used to be the other way as a younger person moving in. So yeah. you're right. It's just such a, and I, and I think the good thing is, as we said, the consumers are getting more educated. It's as much about what we do here in the class and as much as what's going to keep you doing it. And yeah. is it going to be the workout? Because anybody can deliver a workout. Is it going to be the connection to the, the trainer or the people or, you know, what other things can you do for those people and connect to their family? And what other reason you would do this for? Because if you can't take care of yourself, how can you take care of others? Right, 100%. Have you, have you raised pricing at all since in the last couple of years? So, you know, what's interesting is I was always resistant to raising prices. Why is that? You know, growing up, I come from a big family. You know, money was very tight and scarce. Um, I, can't, I had the belief that I didn't want to outprice or price anyone out. I wanted this to be for everyone. What I realized shortly thereafter is the prices that we have raised didn't deter anyone. It just it just showed that, hey, um, if people aren't building value, it didn't matter. If I was charging $88 a month, I would have people fight over that versus when I got up to 160 a month. So like I could right. double the price and I didn't see the volume change. So it realized to me, which then I wanted to pay my people more things cost more like in terms of really learning how to run a business my thought was i'll just sell more and we'll make it up in volume right there comes a point where you can't do that anymore. you can't outsell you the truth right because even a great company has attrition that's right disneyland has people that leave saying i'm never going back there right right like that's yeah. disneyland yeah disneyland has people say i'm never coming back yeah. here. happiest place on earth yeah so there's people that will leave yeah and and it could be more than just they didn't like the workout it could be they moved could be they're pregnant now they have some sort of That's issue right. whatever lost a job so you're gonna have attrition i don't care how good of a company you are mm -hmm. and so even if you go we're just gonna sell more at some point you can't outsell attrition right. because even a small percentage of a big number is a big number that's right so yeah for, for you managing that's really important but when you're able to go man wait a minute if i increase my pricing i can do the same thing with 300 members that it would take me 650 members to do. Yeah. And that's something that kind of, again, the lessons through COVID taught me because when we had to shut down, uh, luckily we were, you know, in a state that was a little more liberal with that process, but we were shut down for approximately six weeks. Yeah. Atlanta was great with that. Luckily. Well, so it was in Atlanta and then some of the outliers. Atlanta was a little tighter than some of my others, okay. but as a whole, Georgia was yeah, yeah. pretty good. But when we shut down, I never would have imagined because all of our agreements are at 12 or 24 months. So we don't do month to month. We don't do day rates. We don't do class rates. I mean, we have them available, but as a whole, we've realized our target is somebody who's committed and needs the, the like most of the goals are not going to be met in a class. Right. And just like so many other things that help hold people accountable, hey, if you're committing to 12 months, you're in it for 12 months. So let's get it done. Like, I know that it's easy to fall off track. No problem. Come back. Let's right, go. Right. You're paying for it. You know, right. um, and people will be like, oh, that's not fair. I want I, well, you. You said you needed this accountability. Right now, that doesn't mean if someone moves or relocates or like there's there's ways, you know, that. But to that point, I mean, we lost probably 40 percent of our clientele over the course of being closed down because cancellations were happening left and right. We couldn't sell anything to add to it. I never would have thought that nobody could have ever predicted something like right. that was going to happen. So when we came back, that was the, one of the first times we raised prices. And I was very nervous about it, but since then I've raised it four times. In, in what time frame? In the last three years, we raised prices four times. you regret raising any of them? No, nope. only the fact that I, I was stuck on that belief that by raising prices, we're gonna, get, we're gonna, we're gonna have less members. Yeah. And what it's done is to, you know, we have probably about 75% of the members that we used to have 
but revenues as much as it was pre-COVID. Yeah, and profit probably more. Better. Yeah, because who cares what the revenue, the, the profit's the biggest thing. Yeah. I'd rather have a million dollar company that's doing 250K in- Yeah, 25% margin. Right, than have a, a $2 million, a $2 million dollar company that's, that's putting out $50,000, yeah. right? Yeah. So a lot of people are really focused on the top line, especially like there's so, so much vanity to it, right? Yeah. Like seven figure business, seven figure business. Yeah. Well, it's great, but man, it's a lot easier to manage a five hundred thousand dollars business that's pulling in two hundred k a year. That's right, and that kind of goes back to you know the original topic was you know when is it time for me to add a new new location or, or scale up? And you got to ask yourself that question: like, what are you looking for? Do you want bigger and more? Do you want more to manage? Do you want a more complex system over time? And it doesn't mean it's ultra complex, but you know you get to two, three, four. Some of these, you know, especially with what we do here at X Three. I mean, we have nine different disciplines or different training options. So to me, it is in one club, it feels like you're running nine individual But they things. all play together. They all work together. So what are, what are the nine things? So you've got regular kickboxing classes, um, which again are, you know, everything from the cardio level, but you're all taught on a, you know, heavy bag, mm -hmm. like just like a pro fighter would do. Uh, boxing classes, you know, similar concept. Then we have our fast track program, which is a speed and agility hit style training class. Then you move into power track, which is barbell style training. Okay. Okay. Then you move into, you have options of advanced kickboxing or Muay Thai training. Okay. And then you, um, then you move into, we have fight and flow and, and yoga, which are two different classes, but they're very similar. Right. They're a great restorative and recovery class. Then you have Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which gets you into more of the, the traditional martial arts, but good for self-defense, great for fitness and fantastic for, you know, mental and all right, well-being. Right. And then you end up with, and then we have private training and youth programs. So that would be nine and ten, but you really yeah. youth is youth. Well, and and you then. have this ring where people can spar. <laughs> That's right. So uh, well, do you do you guys ever do stuff in here like tournaments or anything like that? So we have in the past where we've done like in-house tournaments, whether it's jujitsu or kickboxing. Um, we we kind of got away from it in the past, but I think as time goes on, we're building back towards that to yeah. to create that community and allow people what we call the weekend warrior competitions, you know, because right. not everybody's looking to compete and there's levels between learning and, and being able to do a little bit of sparring to, you know, going and competing in golden gloves to, to trying to be a professional. Right, and right. we have all people of all walks through that. Right. We got these five businesses that are doing very well, a lot of revenue, good profit. It's all exciting. One of the things that I've noticed, and this is actually the reason I've done the show is that, even though you you know more and you've accomplished more than the average person that decided to be a gym owner, you're part of a, a, a group called EO, which I'm a part yeah. of, entrepreneur organization. Mm -hmm. It's like, what, 14,000 people in that? Yeah, chapters so, all over the world. All over the world, or maybe even more than that. I think that might be Accelerator. I got I to gotta yeah, check. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but then on top of that, which is how I think we initially got connected through the EO network, but you're also a part of the Loud Rumor 360 program mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And I don't think you've missed a conference, have you? Or if you did, you not was, since I think you guys started doing them. Yeah, uh, or at least whenever you came back, there might have been one pre us being part of it. But yeah. you haven't missed one. And the question I've got is, with all this, aren't you done? I mean, didn't you figure it all out already? <laughs> Why are you learning still? Uh, you know, I think what you know. There were, <laughs> interestingly, is I think at first I thought I was bringing on the support of Loud Rumor to take the place of things that I needed to do for the team. A little bit of arrogance thought, oh, I don't I don't need it. But also as a leader, I always know that I want to show people that I'm not above doing anything. So I wanted to keep learning and growing, but really I wanted them to learn and grow. But then as I got there, I was like, oh man, you know, there's, even though I might have heard this concept before, I'm in a different place with my own learning. And it, it resonates differently now yeah. than before. You know, now as a person who's thinking about five studios or trying to, you know, become a $10 million company, I've got to think about what is it going to take for me to get us there? Right, right. Um, you know, I think that it's easy to go back and forth and, and look at, you know, the people and the things. And one thing I took even from the last conference, I think it was Mac of Four, but it was like, I've used it probably 10 times since I've been back, which is, as I'm trying to lead my team and they get focused on things, I'm like, all right, are we focusing on the person or, or the problem? Right. Uh, we attack the, the person or the problem. Like right. we got to attack the problem guys. Because right. if the person's the wrong fit, then let's address that. But, right. and that's, you know, in, in such a simple thing. And yet it's gotten us to not get lost in something or turn, 
a, a challenging situation into a conflict. Yeah. It's an opportunity to, to get stronger together. Um, and look, it didn't happen overnight. It still doesn't happen overnight. You still got to come back and want to do the work. So I've been very fortunate to, to realize how much value there is for somebody like me who arguably I could sit back and think I've got it all figured out, right. which I don't. <laughs> right. I tell people first day when we go through orientation, I go, I wish I could tell you we're going to get it right every time, but we're not. We're going to make yeah. some mistakes. So just like I'm going to give everybody grace to, to learn and grow under our umbrella, just know that, that, that you have to do the same for everyone else. And yeah. You know, and, and I get as much out of learning from somebody who, who's maybe just getting started because they're thinking about it so in a, in a much more agility way than maybe I'm. I'm like, oh, I got this big structure, and it takes a lot for me to turn the ship. Versus the minute they change or come up with a new idea, they can go tomorrow, change and implement it because it's right. me and two people. Right. We're all going to do this now, and that's how it was early when you're hungry and scrappy, and you just got to figure it out. Hundred percent. You know, it's funny. Uh... I don't know if you've noticed this, I've noticed this at the conferences, but I look around, I can see it from the stage when I'm at GSDCon, and I'll see you in there, obviously you're doing really well, and you've got your team there, and you're there taking notes. And I look over and I see Karen, who's yeah. got, I don't know, 29 studios, something yeah. like that, and she's there, always taking notes. Roger Martin, CEO of Rockbox franchise, yeah. taking notes. Lance Farrell was there from yeah. Farrell's Extreme, taking notes. Danny Farrar, yeah. to, and asking questions, right? right? And I think what what I love about that, and, and it sends a message to your team. Right. So you are, yeah, your mission was accomplished. Um, was that no? They're not learning because this is like so amazing. They're not learning because they're not that smart. They're in the room with the amount of success they have. They're impressive to you because. This is how they operate. Mm -hmm. They always learn. They're yeah. always looking for something. E even though I know half the time, if not more, when you guys, the high players, people that really know what to do, when you're writing stuff down, it's not so much that you learned it for the first right. time, but that you either A, realize, shoot, I haven't been doing this, or that's right, or, or you go, that's a new way to look at that. Yeah, little nuance change. I haven't thought of saying it that way to my team. Yeah. That's a really good way to break that down yeah. to them. And, you know, I, I, I hope more people really take that away because I see that in EO too. Mm -hmm. The people that I look up to the most in EO, they're doing, you know, $20, 30000000 million dollars right. in their business, $40 million. I look at them and they're always the one like this taking notes. Yeah. And the people that barely make it into EO, they're like on their phones. Yeah. Like scrolling. Yeah. And I'm like, I see it. I yeah. see the difference. And, and yeah, and so many people, I think it's, it, it's, they want to look for what's the one answer that if I just do this, I don't have to do other things. And it's, I wish I could tell you that exists, but it doesn't. No. And, you know, luckily I've come from a, you know, combat sports background, a wrestling background, a fighting MMA background. And what I've learned is no matter how good you get, there's always a nuance. There's always a wrinkle. There's always somebody who you can learn something from because, the variables change, the environment changes. So it's not about once I got it figured out one way and only one way. If you're if you're rigid in that, yeah, you're gonna break. And you don't always have to learn from someone above you. Correct. Right? They don't have to be making more money than you. They don't have to build a more successful business than you. This morning, Mana gave me a great idea today. Yeah. And we're probably gonna see a different like look to the GSD show in a little while here because of that idea. McKenna gave a cool idea. I don't know if you noticed, but when speakers went up on stage at JSDCon, the colors lit up to their brand colors. Yeah. It was it's McKenna's cool. idea. And she was like, oh, we can do this. And so I think it's really good for you know you to be able to acknowledge that. Like, hey, not only can I learn from these people that are doing really well, but I can learn from anybody, yeah. no matter what. There's always something you can pick up That's from right. anybody. Yeah, and you know, like a good example of that again. I want to, you know, where I don't know if they're still they're here, around there. here, yeah. but uh, also, you know, and I have some of my team that I told them, hey, I got some people coming to town on Friday. I'd like to make sure we give them a great experience and a good welcome. I didn't say do anything. I didn't say do this or do that. I didn't, and I came in with with some of you guys, and they like they have these little gift bags ready, and like it was yeah. just. And to me, that's th those things where you see people take ownership and say, I'm going to come up with something that's better than waiting for Mike to tell me what to do. There's a level of like pride that, ownership. hey, this thing is bigger than me anymore. Right. And I now I just got to figure out how I just keep supporting the right people and let them be great. Let them be amazing. Um, yeah. So I love it. Yeah. But you built a great company here, man. I, I wish I... 
This is one model for sure I wish was next door. Because I'd Come miss on, being in the ring. we can figure one out. Uh, I, I just need great ring. partners. <laughs> yeah, hey, deal. That's just like what, my team. Well, I, I'm not kidding you. We are looking for that. So yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying the process of investing in other businesses. So we can look at that. That's for sure. Awesome. Well, Mike, I appreciate it. I know that uh, you're speaking at GST Con in Vegas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Awesome. Love it. Guys, Mike Literal here from X3 Sports. The guy is amazing. If you haven't checked him out, check him out. If you haven't seen him speak at GST Con, he gave probably one of the best talks I've ever seen, especially on culture. Your talk was great. So make sure you guys tune into that. Outside of that, we'll see you next week. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you.